Now, the Gospel of Mark will be our first reading, the Gospel of Mark in chapter 16. Mark 16 and reading from verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And over to the Gospel of John in chapter 3. John 3. We will read a very familiar, famous verse here. We don't have a Bible. It's right here to my left. John 3 and verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. <clears throat> and that is all we'll read. I'm not sure if you've been able to tie together the messages I've uh, delivered in, these, in this past week, but... There is a word in the New Testament that occurs um, in the original language at least 60 times, and it is describing what we have been doing here uh, every night at 730. It is the word preach. In the Greek, the word caruso. It means to stand up and authoritatively declare the message of the gospel, to announce with authority from God the message of the gospel. And we have read that word every night this week. We noticed a man by the name of Legion, and it says, at least in this translation that I'm holding just now, it says that he went back to the city where he was from, Decapolis, and in this translation it says he published, and another translation it says he proclaimed, but the word is he preached. What did he preach? He preached what great things Jesus had done for him, and on Sunday night I tried to tell you just the fringe of some of the great things the Lord Jesus had done for me. Mr. Higgins actually did the same that night as well. We also noticed uh, Paul, he says that we preach Christ crucified. That was his message to the city of Corinth. We notice in the book of Acts chapter 10, Peter, he says that there's a man who's been appointed, Jesus of Nazareth. He's been raised from the dead and he's appointed the judge of the living and the dead whom we preach. And tonight, we read a very famous uh, expression, the Great Commission, uh, as it's commonly known, go into all the world and preach the gospel. You know, <clears throat> sometimes when you find the word, when you find that word preach, it tells you who's doing the preaching, like Paul or Peter, John. Sometimes you find where they're preaching, like Caesarea or Philippi or Samaria. Sometimes you find what they're preaching, like we preach Christ crucified. But here, we find where they're supposed to preach. Go, said the Lord Jesus, into all the world and preach the gospel. And so the gospel that we are here to preach tonight, what I want you to uh, notice is that this is a message for every single person on planet Earth today. No one exempt, no one excluded. It covers every race. It covers every single individual. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And it is because of the very simple and plain verse we've read in John 3.16. It is because for God has loved the world in this way that he has given his only begotten son that if anyone would believe on him, it would not perish but have eternal life. And so it is a message for all the world. And I'm going to look at that tonight and explain uh, why that is the case. You know, there's not too many things that are really for everyone. Even this pandemic, even this pandemic, COVID-19, uh, the very word pandemic implies that it's affecting the whole world. But actually, there are people groups, even in the United States, who haven't been affected at all by COVID-19. They live in a very reclusive uh, way. Some of them don't have access to internet or news. There's a little island, in fact, off the coast of India called the Sentinel Island. They have no uh, cable. They have no internet. There is no one allowed to visit that island at the risk of spreading disease. And I'm not sure if COVID-19 has reached them, but there are people groups in this world who have never heard of COVID, believe it or not. They've never heard of face masks. They've never heard of the vaccine. This thing that has supposedly affected all the world, and of course, for us here tonight, it has affected us. But there are people who have never been affected by it. 
And many of the things that we say, well, this, this, this affects the entire world. No, really, what we mean by that is we mean the general populace, the majority of the population. But not every single man and woman, every single boy and girl breathing at air, not everyone. But this verse and this gospel is for everyone. You will never, never meet a person who is excluded from this. Go into all the world and preach the gospel for, just tying these two verses together, for God has loved that world and given his only son that if any one of them believe on him, they won't perish, but have eternal life. And so it is a message for every single person, everyone. The youngest infant, although they can't understand it, they are a candidate eventually as they come to think rationally to understand the gospel. It is a message for them. Well, why? Why? That's what we're going to look at tonight. Why did the Lord Jesus say, go into all the world? Why does the book of Revelation in, in chapter 5, when they're praising the Lamb, why does it say that they, he has loosed us from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every people? You know, I love preaching here in Midland Park because I look out and, in a sense, all the world is represented in a little sense here tonight. You know, we grew up and we sang that little children's song, English, Irish, Scotch, and Jew, Polish, and Italian, too. And that excluded my family. And that excluded a whole bunch of millions and millions and billions of people were excluded in those six groups. And my wife, one day when she had, I guess, nothing better to do, she added another chorus. And it says... Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, Asian, Arab, African, Russian, Latino, and Australian. And still there's people left out. There's still people left out. So some of you could come up with a fourth chorus. Because you know what? There are people in this world that, that, that we have never even come to know yet. Unreached people groups in different parts of, of, of this world. And yet the love of God has reached and has been demonstrated for every single person on planet Earth. And that is why the Lord Jesus said, go. And to all the world, preach the gospel. Every single person. So why? Well, first of all, it is because every single person has the same problem. Everyone has the same problem. The problem is the problem of sin. It is the problem within us. It's not so much now I'm talking about the problem of the things we do. Because remember, I'm talking about all the world now. I'm talking about the youngest child here tonight. I'm talking about the infant that has just come out of the womb. Every single human being on planet Earth tonight has the same problem. It's the sinful nature within. You see, the Bible, when it comes to the issue of sin, the Bible doesn't teach that the moment you sin... You become a sinner. The Bible teaches that the reason you sin is because you are a sinner. The Bible teaches that you sin because it is within you. It is within your heart. It is in your nature to sin. Like a dog barks because it's a dog. We sin because of who we are in our nature. And it just shows itself. That's why when they uh, criticize the Lord Jesus Christ for not washing his hands, he told them, that from within, from within, from the heart, proceed fornication, adultery, lasciviousness, all of these sins. It comes from the human heart. We talked to a lady in her house not too long ago, and she said that her mission, the way she lives, is she follows her heart. She says, my heart has never led me wrong. I follow my heart. Isn't that a good thing to do? Follow your heart. No, the Bible says your heart is deceitful. Above all things, desperately wicked that's the condition of the human heart and again that's the condition of every single heart in this tent tonight every heart you see you and i would be different in the sins we have done maybe you've never uh stolen the things like i've stolen maybe there's somebody here and you've never taken the lord's name in vain maybe you've never sworn you and i would differ in the things we have done but you know what has us the same? Heart. You know what, my friend? Your heart is no different than Adolf Hitler's heart. Did you know that? You say, no way. No way. Friend, tonight he had a human heart. 
with a human nature, the sinful nature. And it's no different. Yes, he gave it over and did all kinds of things. I'm not saying you would ever do such things. But I'm saying when it comes to the issue of your heart, it is as depraved. It is as dark. It is as wicked as that. It is a sinful heart. And that's the problem, you see. The problem is a sinful heart. Where did it come from? It came from our first father, Adam. That's what the Bible says. That when he took the fruit, he as our first father, he brings us all together in one family. He passed on to us a sinful nature. That's why the Lord Jesus told the most religious man who was living in that day, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You need a new life. You need a new heart. You need a new nature. And that's the same for everyone here tonight, too. You see, the problem, uh, I'm not a big fan of cliches. They haven't helped me too much, but this one has. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. The heart of your problem. It's not that you can't make your mortgage payments or your marriage or maybe a number of addictions. The heart of your problem is your heart. But you know the great news in the gospel through these 25 words of John 3.16. It's God tonight to change that. Heart. Totally change. Completely new. And that's why we're here to preach the gospel. And that's why the Lord Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Because that's what the potential is. When the gospel is announced. And so the reason we go to all the world is because every single person has a sinful heart. And that sinful heart can never enter heaven. Even if it's never shown itself in murder or any kind of a great sin. You see, a heaven is a place where it says in the Bible, it says in the book of Re Revelation, nothing can enter it that will defile. It. See, if our human heart, if my human heart, and that sin, if my sinful heart got into heaven, pretty soon heaven would start looking like Wyckoff, New Jersey. No offense. And it would start looking like planet Earth. And I'm here to tell you, that's not heaven. We went, uh, I was telling some people just the other day, when we went on our honeymoon, my wife and I, we went to a place that was supposedly paradise. And based on the YouTube clip, you know, you watch, and it's like all the nice music and everything. And uh, hey, when we arrived there, it seemed that way. It was beautiful. One day we took a little walk to go try to eat some of the actual food, you know, not the overpriced stuff. And as we walked down and found a local place, just on the corner, there was a homeless man. There was a little shop across the street. And there were some people sitting outside of it. There were people camped out there. You know what I understood in a very simple way? Paradise isn't on planet Earth. That's not paradise. But there is a heaven. There is a heaven. A place where there's no sin. A place of absolute cleanliness and purity. You know what the problem is? Your heart's the problem, my friend. Your heart could never be there. That's the problem. And it was the same for me. And so that's what unites us all problem of our heart but what unites us all is what we've read here as well in john 3 16 and it's the passionate heart god listen to what this verse said oh if i could only preach it to you as i wish i could god so loved the world you mean the people with such depraved and such sinful and sick hearts if it's sick to us imagine what it must be like to a holy god a pure eye, says the book of Habakkuk, than to behold sin. Imagine what it must be like to God. Yet the Bible says that human being so small on this tiny planet that disappears when you zoom out far enough and so sinful in our rebellion against God. The Bible says this. Listen to this verse. God so loved the world. Every single person. There's not a person in this tent tonight who is excluded from the love of God. There's not a person breathing air on planet Earth that is not at this moment loved by God. And the point of this verse is not merely that God says he loves us. When it says God so loved us, I remember I used to think that meant, you know, I'm so hungry. Or it was like an exaggeration. He, he so loves us. But it means, no, it means this is how he loves us. God so loved us. It's like he's holding up an example. He's holding up an illustration. And he's saying, this is how I loved you. What's the illustration? 
Calvary. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that anyone would believe in him. They would not perish, but have eternal life. You see, friend, for the condition of our heart, if your heart is never changed, there's nothing more you need to do. You don't need to swear at your mother. You don't need to rob a bank. If your heart is not changed, you will perish. That simply means to put it in plain today's English, you will be in hell. If the human heart is not changed, it will go where that sinful nature goes, where it deserves to be punished, hell, and eventually the lake of fire. But, says John 3.16, but said the Lord Jesus when he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go tell them that because God has loved this world and given his son, anyone, anyone who will believe on him will not perish, but have eternal life. See, that's the message of the gospel. How people who deserve to be in hell for their sin won't be there because God in his love has given his son. It's a passionate love. It was never forced out of God. God never looked. I'll just use myself as an example. God never looked at me and say, oh, he's really trying hard. He, he deserves my love. He's living the best he can. He tries to be a good boy. He tries to learn his Sunday school verses. And somehow I drew God's love. No, my friend, there was nothing in me that would draw his love. Nothing. God loved me in spite of everything I was. God loves you the same tonight. That's why we preach the unconditional love of God. Love without cause. Love without pause. <laughs> he loves us, friend. Can I tell you that tonight? Can I tell every single person in this tent, from the young people right here all the way to the back corner, there is not a person in this tent tonight that is not loved of God. It's not love. This is a world that is starving for love, true love, not Hollywood love, not movie love. I'm talking about love that cares. I'm talking about true, passionate, real love, love that wants the best for a person. You want to know the love that wants the best? Should not perish. Won't go to hell. Won't go to hell. Why? Not because of the love of a preacher, but because of the love of God. How did, how was it shown? He gave his son. That's what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave it. To where? Not merely to this world. Not merely to the manger or the poor streets of Nazareth. He gave him to the cross. And on the cross, do you know what the Lord Jesus was doing? He was making a way, a righteous way. He was making a righteous way for God to let a sinful boy like me not perish. How, how could he do it? In order to let me not perish, he would have to judge my sin. You know what happened on the cross? Listen to the words of Romans 8. God condemns sin in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Romans chapter 8, he condemns sin in the flesh he judged sin in the body of christ it says in first peter 2 that jesus the lord jesus he bore our sin is there someone here tonight listen to these words listen he bore our sin in his body on the cross he took it he bore it he, he was judged under it everything that it means to perish and even more than what it means, more than what any soul will ever experience in hell. He took it on himself. He took the full wrath of God on himself on the cross. He who had never sinned. And he not only faced it, but he finished the wrath of God. It was done. It was all done. How do we know? Because after the Bible says Christ died for our sins, the same Bible says God raised him from the dead. That's why we preach, by the way, the resurrection of Jesus. Because if he's not been raised, we have absolutely nothing. If he's not been raised, a trip to Calvary is just a trip to a sightseeing a sight. 
Friend, tonight it's because the tomb is empty. It's because sin has been defeated. It's because the grave has been conquered. It's because God has been satisfied that tonight you can be saved. You can be saved tonight. Why? Because God is satisfied when it comes to sin. So you and all your sin and all your sinful heart, you who can never satisfy God, no matter how much you tried to do, because you have a sinful heart. God has found satisfaction in someone else. And the moment you do what? The moment you believe. The moment you rest, just like I'm standing here on this platform. The moment you place your weight on the Lord Jesus Christ. Nothing else. Not Jesus in your church. Not Jesus in baptism. Not Jesus in a good life. The Lord Jesus Christ alone. The moment we rest on Christ. You know what happens? What the verse says happens. They have everlasting life. They're saved. They're no longer going to perish. You know, tonight, I am never going to face the punishment for my sin. It will never fall on me because it fell on Christ. And I am resting everything, my eternity, on what God has said in his word. What has he said? He was wounded for our transgressions. And I have rested in what God said. And I'm saved. How about you? You see, just the, the world, the message here, go into all the world, a message of, of a problem, a message of God's passionate love that was seen in answering the problem. But although it's a message for all the world, it's not a, it's not a message that can just be received by the whole tent at once. You don't form a committee and say, we've decided, Joseph, we've decided to receive that message. No, my friend, it's a personal decision. That's why I look at what it says. It says he loved the whole world, but then it comes right down to Whosoever. And he, it comes right down to just you. It comes down to you. It comes down to a single person making a conscious, rational choice to trust Christ or reject him. And you will make that choice to me. You turn again, please, to John chapter 3. Now, Mr. Baker had no idea what I was going to speak on tonight, so I can only hope that God is speaking loudly to someone in the tent this evening. Verse 16. John chapter 3, and again, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's just one word that I would like to focus our attention on tonight. It is the word so. And I'm going to ask you again, along with me, to just try to measure God's love for you. I want to notice with you the length and the depth and the breadth and the height of that love. There was a parable the Lord Jesus told in the gospel written by Luke in chapter 15, in which he described the sheep that had gone astray. And when he spoke about the shepherd going after the sheep, he added those significant words that he would go after the sheep until he find it, until he find it. That is indicating the length to which the Lord Jesus goes until he find it. And it is reminding us of the length that God has gone to try to reach you and to save you until he find it. Think about our distance from the shepherd. That, of course, is self-imposed. A shepherd doesn't chase the sheep away. There's something in the heart of a sheep that draws it away from the flock and from the fold and from the shepherd that can protect it. It spots an attractive piece of grass, and then it sees some more, and then it heads further. And, and before you know it, the sheep has wandered away, and it has no capacity, as you know, to come back. God is not the source of our problem. The human predicament is not a result of God. It is because we have turned away from God. And as Isaiah says, we have turned everyone to his own way. And of course, it's very foolish because a helpless sheep can't survive without a shepherd. There are many occasions and many events, many times, 
The dogs have found their way home from remarkable distances away. But a sheep can't find its way from around the corner. It has no homing capacity. The only protection it has, it has no, it has no weapons. It has no fangs, it has no claws, it can't emit ink, it can't fly away. It's absolutely helpless. It is dependent on the shepherd. And if the shepherd doesn't go after it and find it, then the sheep is going to perish. There's that word again. The sheep is going to perish. The very well-known historian, Will Durant, said some time ago that the greatest question of our time is not communism versus individualism. It is not Europe versus America. It is not even the East versus the West. Are you listening? He said, it is whether men can bear to live without God whether human beings can live without God. You might as well try to live without oxygen for your body to expect your soul to experience anything of peace or satisfaction or joy without God. Our distance from the shepherd required that he would go all the way till he found. It. Of course, there was a great danger, wasn't there, from the wilderness. Now, this was something that was inevitable, no matter how long the sheep survived. And there's no point by talking about sheep being clever because they're not. But no matter how long the sheep survived in the wilderness, it would eventually be caught and killed. You can take your vitamins. You can watch your cholesterol. You can watch your diet. You can be very careful. You can drive according to the speed limit. You can wear three masks, if you will but you will never be able to defeat death. It is inevitable. The last time I checked, one out of one person died. Everyone. One day I am going to die. One day you're going to die. That is something that is inevitable. I would suggest to you that it is the heights of wisdom to get ready for what is absolutely unavoidable and inescapable. The shepherd loved the sheep he wanted to save it from dying from perishing and so that phrase until he find it means that he allowed nothing to hinder him from making salvation possible nothing hindered the lord jesus from making salvation possible for every human being they tried to stone him to death as our brother reminded us the other night they tried to throw him off the brow of a hill but you see, God had said he would go to a cross and he would die on a cross, the death of the curse, bearing my sins and his body on the tree so that he could provide salvation for the world. The devil tried to hinder him from going. His disciples tried to stop him from going. Nothing would turn him aside from going to where he could provide salvation for every lost sinner. Think about the depths to which he sank. Prophetically, the Bible describes what the Lord Jesus went through as though he had gone into the lowest pit. There's a man in our Bible named David who described what he was, his spiritual condition. And he said, God had brought him up from a horrible pit, a horrible pit. It's describing the awful misery and effects of sin. Sometime just do the calculation and think how many generations of human beings it required for the human race to produce a Galileo or an Isaac Newton or a Michael Faraday. And then back up from that and ask yourself the question, how many generations of human beings did it take for the human race to produce a murderer? One. That's how rapidly sin works. Sin comes into the world and the first boy born into the world murders his brother. A horrible pit of sin into which we had all sunk as a result of our coming into the world of sin. Jeremiah was cast into a pit and he sank in the pit and, and there was no way that he could save himself. There was no bread. There was no water up in the palace. There's a man interested in Jeremiah's welfare who says to the king, he's going to die there. He was helpless. He could not save himself. It's picturing our helplessness as well. Job described us all as going down to the pit. It is the picture of a person descending into eternal destruction, perishing forever if that person fails to obtain forgiveness for sin. 
the Golden Gate Bridge at certain points is 220 feet above the bay. It takes four seconds for a person to step off that bridge and hit the bay. 1,600 people have tried. All of them have died except for 33. And among those 33 is a young man. Let's give you his first name, Kevin. On September 25th, 2000, he said he took what was his last meal, just some sugar, just to get ready for what he was about to do, Skittles and Starburst. Stepped onto the bridge, leaped over the railing. Four seconds. And Kevin said he regretted every one of those four awful seconds. He said they're, they're surged. They're surged inside of him. Such a longing to live. And here he was destroying his life. He said it was the first millisecond, the first moment of free fall. I knew it was the worst mistake I had ever made. You see, we rarely understand, we rarely hear the language of a suicide because tragically they're often successful. Thank God Kevin survived. Now he's telling you what it was like to take that awful step off of the bridge and in four seconds to plummet. When you hit the water from that height, it has been estimated it is like driving into a brick wall, hitting it head on with no seatbelt. Generally, there's, there's internal damage, bones are broken. Four seconds, he said he regretted every one of those four seconds. It just takes one second. It just requires one second for a soul to step from earth to eternity, from here to there, from time to where time is no longer calculated or reckoned. And if that happened to you tonight, are you sure? That you will be in heaven. Is there anything more important? Is there anything more vital? Is there anything of greater significance? Is there any emergency in your life that can compare to being sure that you are safe for eternity? That's why the Lord Jesus came to the awful depths of Calvary, because going into that lowest pit is an awful picture of the internal spiritual sufferings that the Lord Jesus endured. You see, no shame could equal what he endured. It was not merely death, but it was even the death of the cross. There was no shame to equal that. That was the death of a criminal. Do you know all a person had to do was say in Latin, I am a Roman citizen? And he could not be crucified. The only reason a Roman citizen could be crucified is if he had betrayed the nation. Otherwise, those three Latin words, that was the phrase in Latin, those three Latin words meant he would never, he would never have to suffer the shame of crucifixion. If he had faced, if he had done something that meant he had to face the extreme penalty, there would be a more merciful, less shameful way for a Roman citizen to die. But Christ died even the death of the cross. When Paul wrote those words, he was writing words that he knew he would never experience. He was a Roman citizen. He would never be crucified. But Christ was. There's no sacrifice that could equal his. It wasn't merely for sin. The Bible says that there at Calvary, he became a sin offering. In other words, he took my sins upon himself. The sin offering in the Old Testament was in picture form, bearing the sins of the person for whom it was dying. And then when it was placed on the altar, the fire consumed it. So when the Lord Jesus became, his soul was made an offering for sin. It means that he took on him my sins. On that cross, on that April day, he took on him my sins. And then he took the wrath of God against those sins, his own judgment against my sins. He absorbed it all in his own person at Calvary. Peter simply writes, he bore our sins in his own body on the tree. That's the depths to which he went. There was no pain. 
that could equal his. It wasn't merely a pit. It was the lowest pit. It wasn't merely coming into, he said, deep waters, but into deep waters where there were no standing. It wasn't just coming into the waters. He said, the waters have come in unto me. What happened at Calvary, friend, was an infinite being suffered infinitely. For you. Now, I don't know what you think of Calvary, and I don't know up till this point this evening in this meeting what you thought when you thought about three crosses and a place called Calvary and a man called Jesus. But he went there for you. He knows your name. He knows everything about you. Tell you something even more incredible. The day he went to Calvary. He knew your name then. And he knew all about you then. And he knew every one of your sins then. And all I can tell you is if you come to understand the meaning of these five words. You'll thank God forever. Christ died for the ungodly. That on that cross, he took my sins. He took the wrath that was due to those sins. He suffered for sins. The just for the unjust. To bring me to God. But think about the breadth of his salvation. That brings us to that word whosoever that my brother Baker has been telling us about. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. In one of his parables, the Lord Jesus described the invitation reaching to people who were poor and maimed and halt. They were crippled and blind. And the Lord Jesus earlier in the chapter had said to someone, when you have a supper, when you, when you have a feast, don't invite your friends who can turn around and invite you back. Invite the poor. Invite the maimed. Invite people who are in great need. Bring them in. And then he goes on to tell the parable that this is exactly what God has done. God is inviting sinners to his home, to his heaven, whosoever believes in him. God wants you to have his salvation tonight so that you can live forever with him. In one of his miracles, the Lord Jesus showed that he cared for a man who was not only a leper, he had leprosy, an odious and disgusting disease, visibly, visibly disgusting. But the man was a Samaritan. He was not a member of the Jewish nation. He was, to use that dreaded word, an outsider. See? And he's along with nine other Jews, nine Jews, other lepers. And the ten of them cried to the Lord Jesus to have mercy. And he healed every one of them. Nine of them go their way, apparently, to the Jewish priest. One of them had nowhere else he could go. He turns back and he comes back to the Lord Jesus. And he falls at the Savior's feet. And he, a man who was ethnically outside of all blessing, who was ceremonially unclean and outside of any blessing, kneels at the feet of the blessed and thanks him for what he has done. It is reminding us that God loves everyone. And has provided salvation for all. In one of his responses to appeals for help, there were many times when people pled for his help. In one of his responses to a plea for help, he saved a dying malefactor, a condemned outcast of society, a crucified man. Now, you know, it's so easy to read the words. And not stop and think what's going on. So I'm going to ask you now to just do a little bit of mental imagination. Are you ready? I want you to think of the last time that you were sick, that you were really sick. I want you to think of some time when you had such a pounding headache, you could hardly see straight. Now, of course, if you're a mother, that doesn't matter because you're still going to do the work around the house. Doesn't matter how sick you get. But I think the guys here, you know what it's like, right? Think of when you were so sick, you were in such pain. And tell me what you were thinking about. Were you thinking of others? Were you thinking of whom you could help? 
What did you want? You wanted the pain to go away. You wanted to get better. You wanted to get back to doing what you wanted to do for the day. None of us, none of us has ever known one millionth of the pain of crucifixion. Our English word excruciating was cobbled together from crucifixion. Pain coming out of the cross. In the midst of all of that inutterable, inexpressible, indescribable agony. The Lord Jesus plucks a sinner from going to hell. Responds to his plaintive cry and says, today you will be with me in paradise. I see it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what you've done. God so loved the world that he gave his son for you. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So as I close, I want you to think about the height of his blessing. I think it would be an incredible thing if God's salvation meant that I would not have to go to hell. If it meant that I would live and die if, if our souls did not exist forever. If salvation just meant I wouldn't have to face a judgment for my sin. That would be worth preaching. Whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now my auto insurance provider is AAA. So I'm going to give you a AAA. Please remember this now. Here they are. Adam, Abraham, and angels, those three. Adam, Abraham, and angels. The Lord Jesus is offering to lift you tonight past Adam in his innocence. Here was Adam in the Garden of Eden. God would come down and visit with Adam. Adam had not yet sinned, but Adam could sin. Very soon, Adam would Tore up, tear up the deed and lose paradise and lose everything. God is offering to lift you tonight past an innocent man into a holy heaven where sin will never touch you again. That's the height of his salvation. He's offering to lift you past Abraham. You see, God entered into a promise. It's called a covenant with Abraham. And Abraham was promised that he would be the father the father of multitudes. But you know what Abraham never experienced? Abraham, who was going to be a father of nations, knew nothing about ever becoming a son of God. And you know what God is offering to do tonight? Adopt you. Put you in his family. Make you a child of God. Make you an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. He's offering to lift you past Adam and his innocence. He's offering to lift you past Abraham and all of the earthly blessings that Abraham was given. He's offering to lift you past angels. In their unfallen state, angels appreciate the greatness and the holiness of God. But listen, sometime you just take a quick run through Revelation chapter 4 and 5 and you will notice something. You will notice John describing huge circles of praise for the great creator and the great redeemer. You will see it. You will see it like, like, like concentric circles widening and embracing the entire universe. But there's only one group that sing. You'll read about people saying this. You'll read about the, the four living creatures saying this. You'll read about all creation saying this. And then you'll read about something that angels can't do. You'll read about redeemed human beings who will sing a new song and will say, Thou art worthy, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made us a kingdom of priests to our God. God is offering to do that for you tonight.
June 25th of 1956. The last, uh, for those who are young, I am about to mention the name of a car. It's probably a name you have never heard before. The last Packard rolled off the assembly line. The Packard was a classic American luxury car. And it had a very interesting advertising slogan. Here's how they advertise the Packard. Ask the man who owns one. Now you see, before the meeting tonight, without even thinking of this, I happen to pull up and see a Subaru there, and it belongs to my good friend, Andrew Zudema. And I said, Andrew, how do you like your Zudema? He said he loved it. Always good to love your car. And then he began to describe the features about it that he liked, the safety about it, right? I was asking a man who owned one. Packard's slogan was, ask the man who owns one. He'll tell you what a wonderful car it is. So please, instead of asking Satan, instead of asking the media, instead of asking the world, ask somebody who's saved. Ask somebody who's saved what they think of the Lord Jesus. Ask someone who has eternal life what they think about God's salvation. Ask somebody who has it. And I can tell you to the last woman, girl, boy, and man, a person is truly saved, he would recommend Christ to you with all his heart. See, there aren't many things in life that you can do that. Subaru or not, but not too many things that you can say, this is for everybody. This, this will fit you. This will suit you. This is what you need. But I can when it comes to Christ. And I can when it comes to God's salvation. And I can tell you that God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son, his unique son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, have everlasting life. I hope tonight you'll trust that son of God. I hope tonight you'll just take God at his word that whoever believes in him will never be in hell, but will have everlasting life.